I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 as we remain in the book of Romans today and actually go over a passage that we have already preached on before, even two weeks ago. Normally, when we draw near to the Lord's Supper, we do isolate and talk about, indeed, the Lord Himself, the Lord who has given us His heart and His life. And we found a passage in the midst of our last passage, just one verse that to me just hit my heart and made me think, think about exactly what am I doing here on this earth? What am I doing and what's my, what's my star, the North Star of my life? It all wraps up in something that's very unique, unique. Have you ever met somebody truly unique? I mean, really unique. I bet you everybody wishes that they could meet a unique person that they have known from history. You could think about biblical history. Who's your favorite prophet? Who's the person that you would like to meet sometime out there? Uh, I would like to think that I would, would just love to sit down with Isaiah sometime and listen to what he had to say. I would like to meet some people in history. Uh, some of you know I like military history, and there's a unique man in World War II that I would like to just watch him in action. Uh, George Patton just fascinates me, both for good reasons and for bad. And I think of Thomas Edison. I remember I went to Edison, high, uh, Edison grade school, and, and we studied Thomas Edison, and you study that fellow. My, what an interesting man. What a resilient person. But how about, do you have anybody in your family, people that you've heard of over the years that you'd really like to meet? You'd like to meet that great-grandfather that everyone's heard about? You'd like to meet somebody like that? Thomas Lemuel Thompson. Well, that's who I want to meet. Thomas Lemuel was a drummer boy in the Civil War and had a family, a big family. Then his wife died, exhausted, I'm sure. And then he had another family. And the very last one in that train of 13 children that he had was my grandfather. I want to meet that guy. I've seen his picture. Oh, boy. I'd like to meet him. Isn't it exciting to have somebody unique and unusual in your family? In your family? But, you know, each one of you has somebody. And it doesn't have to be the crazy uncle who went screaming down the streets once in a while. The one who, when people would say, are you related to so-and-so, you'd hang your head and say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we are. Ira is mine. <laughs> but you've got somebody unique in your family. Somebody absolutely unique. Somebody unusual. Somebody who is worth having supper with when we come together. In the book of Romans, you recall in chapter 12, we began this saga of understanding what it meant to think like Christians, to have our minds renewed, and how that applies to every situation and every relationship in our life. In the last passage that we preached on two weeks ago in Romans 14, the passage was, how do you deal with people who are true believers in Christ but are different than you? The vegetarians who wanted only to eat vegetables, the ones who wanted to observe all kinds of odd worship and, ho and Christian holidays that, that you didn't think were necessary, how does people deal when they've got opinions that are different even though they're Christians? But in the middle of that passage is a verse where Paul kind of comes back to the whole thing. If you're trying to figure out how to deal with somebody, here is your spot. Here's your North Star. Here's your guidance. I'll read the whole passage, but we'll focus on verse 9. Hear God's word. Romans 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. 
The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to the Lord, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So that each of us will give account of himself to God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. One verse jumps out at me, and as we often do to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we think about the one who is our host today. One verse in verse 9. To this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. There's just two things I want to notice today, and I hope they'll be rather quick, and it's rather what we might call devotional, not necessarily instructional, maybe not even inspirational, but devotional. And first of all, say this, no one has done what Christ has done. No one has done what Christ has done. Your greatest hero has not, and you certainly have not. And what has he done? In verse 9, look at it, for to this end, Christ died and lived again. Frequently, we will pray, oh, Christ, we thank you for your life and your death. And we say he lived and died for us. But notice the way it's positioned here. In verse 9, to this end, Christ died and lived. Notice the living that he's talking about isn't just his perfect life. It isn't just the righteousness whereby he completely and totally obeyed the law without error. It is that he died and then he lived. Here's the important part of our faith, our belief. Christ died. Well, no one disputes that. Everyone dies. But he died in a special way. He was, in the Old Testament, one who was cursed because he died on a tree. And then it says he rose. He lived again. He rose. Now, dying is not so unique though I believe the way he died is certainly unique, and who he died for is unique. But he lived after he died. Now that's unique. Thomas Edison nor Thomas Thompson ever rose again from the dead in their life three days afterward. That is what sets the Lord Jesus Christ apart. But let's stop and just think about it for a moment. First of all, Dying means something, and the way he died means something. He died as one who came as the perfect priest. Remember, we often think of Jesus who as the anointed one. The word Christ that Paul used here means anointed one. is the same word as the Old Testament Messiah. He is the anointed one that is the prophet and the priest and the king. He was a perfect prophet in that he came and taught us perfect words from God. He is a king, as we'll see in a few moments. But he is the priest. He came and offered himself as a sacrifice, not just as the man, but as a perfect man. The old Puritans used to call it, he, had a, he was a public man, a man for others, a representative man. He was, the Bible teaches us, the second Adam, the one whose death was unmerited because he was perfect. And yet his death was sure and true because he was a substitute for us. He was a sacrifice, and the Bible uses the word atonement for us. Now, atonement means several things in the Bible, but it means that his death was one of four things, and actually all of four things. His death was a reconciliation by blood. His death satisfied justice by his blood. His death reconciled us with God by his blood. And his death, using that favorite word that we use that we don't hear very often, propitiated God who was rightfully and justly wrathful. That's what his death was. 
And by his death, we have union with his death. We hear about that. We speak of it fairly often. But it's difficult to grasp. That is that Christ is in us and we are in him. That union with Christ accomplished by the Holy Spirit is powerful and real. And when we say that he died and died for us, it's not only on our behalf, but his death takes place within us in that in earlier part of Romans, it says that we died to sin and we died to death because of that. One person said the way to illustrate the union with Christ is by air. We are in the air, but the air is also in us. Indeed, we are unified with Christ. Now, in the context, this really means, doesn't it, that if we are following Christ and he died for us, then why are we quibbling over such small potatoes? Why are we quibbling over being a vegan or being a meat eater in the context? And Hebrews also tells us that if Christ died, if he fought temptation so badly to get out of there and not do what he was not what, what, what he did not deserve, and that is to take death upon himself, if that's true, then why can't we endure, even to the point of shedding our blood, against temptation, against selfishness? You see, he died. The Lord laid on him, in the words of Isaiah 53. The Lord laid on him the transgressions of us all. He died, and he rose and risen from the dead means a few things. It means that, that we proved, he proved that death was not stronger than his righteousness. That the sacrifice that he gave was satisfied. That, in other words, it was good enough. The fact that he died isn't just what we need. Romans 4.25 says that he rose for our justification. That is, that his forgiveness of us was keyed to his resurrection. Because that means that the bill came back paid in full. Have you ever heard of that concept of paying it forward? You know, sometimes you'll see somebody in a grocery line. and I heard a story of somebody. They were in a grocery line, and she was fighting with the kids. <clears throat> Sarah, this will happen to you some, sometime soon. Fighting with the kids, fighting with the kids and trying to get through and, and, and put the groceries in. And when the grocery counter came up, it said it was, it was $200. And then you can see the eyes of the, of the mama wide open. And the person behind her said, hey, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. What do they call that? Paying it forward? People do that in McDonald's lines. They don't do it often at George's, but they do it at McDonald's lines. <laughs> Pay it forward. Pay it forward. This guy then wrote a check not only for his groceries, but for hers. The next time she came back to the grocery store, she found out the check bounced. <laughs> and they expected their $200. Jesus Christ has written us a check. He has paid it forward to us. And yet his life and his death was indeed perfect. He had an account that was full of his merit and his strength. And we don't have to pay because of him. That was declared at his resurrection. He was declared to be God himself. Not just a man, but God. And sits even now at the right hand. And now by the Holy Spirit, that resurrection is in us. So that we will one day be resurrected. But also, we live in light of the power of the resurrection now. Sin has no power over us. We don't have to sin anymore. Well, this sounds like basic theology lecture today, doesn't it? But you see, this very verse gives us a moral structure to the universe. What do I mean by that? That there is a God, and there is good, and there is evil. And our problem in this world is evil. It is sin. And we have to deal with sin somehow. Sin keeps you from coming into the presence of a holy God. And if you don't have a covering for your sin, if you don't have a sacrifice for that which makes you be the sacrifice, then you cannot come into his holy presence. Heaven is not there for you. You see, we come to the supper today. The supper shows that he died, but his body is not here. He has risen from the dead. And the structure of this universe tells us that being good is not enough. 
Feeling that you're going to be true to yourself is not a religion that gets you to heaven. Being your own best person, as wonderful as that might be, isn't enough. What you need, above all things, is somebody to die and to live for you and in you. That's the first thing that makes him unique. No one has ever done what Christ has done. But secondly, I'd like to tell you that no one has, no one is what Christ is. Look at verse 9 again. For to this end, for to this end. In other words, he's going to tell you why Christ died and lived again. There was a purpose to his doing. It's because he loves you. And yes, we hear that in the scripture. And we know that for God so loved the world. You heard that passage. He loves you. He wants to bring you into his presence. And the sin that harms that has got to be dealt with somehow. But, but what does it say is the purpose here in verse 9? For to this end Christ died and lived again, that, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Lord, this, this very important word. In the Roman world, they were just a few blocks away from the Roman tribunal where Curias Caesar would set up shop or one of his lackeys. Curias Caesar, Caesar, Curias, Lord, ultimate Lord. Interestingly enough, Curias is also the Greek word that translates in the Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament, Yahweh. And what Jesus is saying to them, it's not Caesar, it's not the president, it's not the most unique person in your family, it's not the most important person you know, but the one who is really Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his doing, it was declared to the world that he is Lord. Now, Lord means universal sovereign, the king, that he is God himself, he's the focus of history. He is the end of all the universe. He gives meaning to all of our existence and he gives us a hope for the future because if he sits at the right hand and he is in union with us, he will almost like a rope pulling up a climber up a cliff bring us to that place himself. But the Lord also means something to you every day. Notice it says in verse 9, to might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. The dead who have gone before us, he's Lord of them. They're still alive by the Spirit. He takes care of them. And he will take care of us if they're, by some reason, we have to die for this amazing faith that we have been given. But he says he is the Lord of the living. In the context, remember the point he's trying to make. The point he's trying to make is that, hey, Jesus is the Lord of the vegans and of the meat eaters. Jesus is the Lord of the calendar watchers and the Lord's day only watchers. He is the Lord of the Baptist and the Methodist and the Presbyterian. He is the Lord of all. So why do we quibble so much and break fellowship so often? Why don't we just come to where Jesus is and call him Lord? Well, you see, that's true. But it also means in daily life. It also means every day. He's our Lord. He's the boss. He's the one that calls the shots. You see, in modern Christianity, I have noticed some changes over the years that I have become a Christian as a teenager. I have noticed some changes, and some of them are, are good, I would imagine, but some of them are disturbing. And one of the most disturbing things that I have noticed about the state of Christianity in the world today is that it seems to be a philosophy bent on making us feel better about ourselves. We've often called it the therapeutic religion. I want to go to a church where I feel better. I want to go to a church that makes me this or makes me that. But we skip a few steps when we do that. As important as that is, what God has called us to is to his lordship. It's not all about us. It's not I come to church because it makes me happy. Someday there'll be something that doesn't make you happy. A prayer that won't go answered. A difficulty that you can't get out of. A problem with your kids that when you pray, God doesn't immediately solve it. Oh, oh I, 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 it's, it's what I want because it makes me feel important. Well, the only thing that's important here is the Lord. 
He did it so that he might be declared as Lord. And I'm pretty happy with that because when I go around strutting as though I'm the Lord, I seem to get in trouble all the time. I seem to do silly things. When I mess up what the point of my religion is, I tend to go the wrong direction. But if it's about Christ, my Lord, things seem to start working out. There's a great story that I heard about Henry Ward Beecher, a, a preacher in the 1800s that I don't know I could recommend his theology, but he was one of the greatest preachers of the day. And one Sunday, his church was filled and people would come from miles around. He was up north and people would empty Boston and empty New York and go, they were gonna, let's go hear Beecher this week. Let's go hear Beecher. And one of the deacons stepped up into the pulpit one Sunday and said, uh, Mr. Beecher has been taken sick and will not preach this morning. His assistant will preach today. And people started getting up and leaving. This man was amazing. They came to hear Beecher. And the deacon then reached out and said, and any of you who came today to worship Henry Ward Beecher may leave. And those who came to worship the Lord Jesus Christ may stay. Wouldn't you feel about that tall? But sometimes we get that focus off, don't we? Who's the Lord of your life today? Is it you? <laughs> Is it your children? Is it your accomplishments? Is it your pleasure? Is it doing things your way? I know that in this room today and in the hearing of my voice, there's probably somebody who's not sure about Christ. In fact, I'd say there's probably several of you. And so today, I, I do every Sunday, I've got to make sure that I present to you, whether you're so young that you haven't really considered Christ before, or you've been coming to church all your life, and coming to church is your religion. Being good might be your religion. Well, that's okay. Have you seen the commercials lately? Do you want just an okay builder, an okay mover? If you want a plumber, do you want an okay plumber? I was an okay plumber. You want to see the floor that all got all wet because of that? I've got a doctor for you. He's really okay. Do you want an okay doctor? Now, I think it's phone services on, on, the, on the television. But the point is, do you want an okay North Star? Do you want an okay Lord? Oh, keep being your own Lord. I'm sure it's okay. But it won't get you to heaven. And it won't get you to satisfaction. And it won't give you to forgiveness. Jesus, there's nobody like him. No one's ever done what he's done and nobody is who he is. Today, if you hear his voice, ask him to save you. Ask him to save you. But most of us are here today for this wonderful Lord's Supper and for this wonderful baptism. As we come to the waters of baptism, do you know Maggie is going to grow up in a different world than maybe some of you gray hairs grew up in. She's going to grow up in a world where right and wrong is defined by just on what you feel, not on about what's going on outside. She's going to grow up in a world that doesn't have a big picture. You know, that's the key, past, the key characteristic of what they call the postmodern world. There's no big picture. There's no philosophy that unites us. It's all about ourselves. And if there's one thing, we want to come and tell Maggie and tell every little child that's here, Jesus is the big picture. It's the thing that unites heaven and earth. It's the thing that will touch our hearts. And as we come to the table today, it's not just a religious ceremony. We're not just coming to eat with our friends and to feel good about ourselves. We have been invited to dinner with the king. The king. Any kings invited you to eat lately? Any presidents? Maybe a governor here or there possibly. They're, no, they're okay. But they're not unique. And by the Holy Spirit as we come to this table. He not only invites us. He calls us. One Puritan that I read this week said, 
I must believe in Jesus even <coughs> if I receive no benefits from it. Isn't that amazing? I must believe even if there are no benefits. If there's no heaven, if there's no forgiveness, I must call and ask him if I might believe in him <coughs> because he's Lord. But I say to you, there are benefits. There are benefits. You'll never be loved like you'll be loved by Christ. You'll never be accepted like you're accepted by Christ. You'll never be helped like you'll be helped in Christ. You'll never be taken to heaven like you can be taken to heaven in Christ. You'll never be protected like you will be protected by the King. And if you keep your eye on him and follow him as Lord, you'll never be a better husband than you are if you follow him. You'll never be a better parent. You'll never be a better difference maker. You'll never be the same if you follow him. Today, part of this supper is for Christians to re-covenant that they will follow him. Before the last Queen of England was coronated in the Westminster Abbey, before the crown is placed on her head, the Archbishop of Canterbury calls out to the four directions, north, east, west, and south. And he says, I offer to you your undoubted queen. Will you pay her homage? And I declare to you today that God, as it were, sits on his throne and says, I offer to you your undoubted king. Will you pay him homage? Let's pray. Oh, God, our Father, we ask you that in the midst of your near presence to us today, in the midst of promises made, covenants. We pray that we would see Jesus as our Lord. We thank you, Father, that Jesus died and lived. And we thank you that he is Lord. In a world that confuses us, it is, Father, a place to stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.